Thank you. I'm glad uh, to be uh, here for this talk to talk about reuse. And uh, the first picture you see, that's actually my grandmother on the right with all her uh, family. And this picture was taken in 1921. And like the lady right uh, in the center, she has some kind of a box in her hand. We would call this box today probably the the, the eye, whatever, f uh, part or some, something. And, and uh, so uh, my grandfather here on the right, he was building this uh, tube radio on, on the desk uh, in also in the early 1920s. And when I was about eight years old uh, in the late 50s, I found this radio in the attic and uh, I didn't know what it was, and, uh, but my parents told me, never plug it in, in 220 volts, you might hurt yourself. Of course, as soon as they was gone, I plugged it in, <laughs> and amazing sounds came out, out of this box, uh, listening with the, with the headphones. And realizing when you change these coils, like these couple coils, you could uh, listen to different stations, could listen to different Morse code and high pitch sound. Anyway, it, it was my first experience um, to listen to sounds I never heard before, which I could manipulate. So I went uh, to the uh, chunk or to the dump and collected all these tube radios, put them, stacked them on top of each other, took all the chassis off, but connected all the wheels, like the, where you uh, tune the, the stations in, like the capacitors, like this old fashioned uh, aluminum uh, discs. And they was all hooked up to one kind of a big uh, pulley system. So when I ch uh, changed one pulley, all the radio changes, the radio station changed, so you could really make some rhythmic patterns. You, it was kind of a synthesizer almost, but just made with old tube radios, and just like the one my grandfather uh, was building. So, so slowly I learned how, how this stuff actually worked. And at the same time, I was also taking music lessons. I was practicing um, and learning the, the trumpet, the flugelhorn, and uh, I wasn't kind of satisfied with the sounds uh, coming out because it was kind of monophonic. And I was thinking how to change it to make stereophonic uh, <laughs> sounds out of a horn, out of a trumpet or trombone. And also like how to go from the fixed three valve tuning system into more a microtonal system where you actually change the, uh, the, uh, the whole uh, tamper the whole kind of pitches and also like adding other horns, you know, like a tuba with the other kind of a horn just to add this other kind of uh, a polyphony of sound, uh, which is not possible usually with, with just like uh, with a brass instrument. So this turned, you know, into like real instruments where you uh, could uh, play uh, in different modes and different tuning systems and uh, Stereo, trombone, the right hand would uh, operate the valves, the left hand the slide, and the mouthpiece had, uh, was split so your tongue basically decided left or right channel, and uh, so you could uh, play either one or both together. But uh, when I was about 18, 19, uh, allergy on my lip uh, started to get very bad, uh, so I had to quit to uh, practicing all these instruments. And then I changed to read instruments, the tongue got infected, so a few years later I had to quit uh, playing uh, the reed instruments. So then I couldn't, the dream was over to be a musician or a composer, or not a particular composer, but I couldn't practice any instrument anymore. And so I was starting to draw my lips because I never had any formal drawing lessons or uh, wasn't educated in, in, in creating this drawing. So I just was wondering what my lips actually did 
it was so easy just to blow an instrument with your mouthpiece, but I couldn't, I had to learn or think about, could I actually draw my lips? Because they did something, and the same thing is I was starting to carve my hands out of a block of wood just to realize what actually my hand did when I was playing these instruments. So slowly I switched uh, from the just playing instrument, learning what actually this kind of uh, tools are doing to an instrument by just trying to create this um, this way how to model, how to sculpt actually your hands. And so I just carved them out of wood. So different kind of um, con configurations with instruments. I was starting to uh, go more in a sculptural uh, way to, to express what's going on. And uh, this was back in Berlin, uh, where I was living in the 70s. And uh, I was switching more from uh, music, more into theater and music. So my uh, studies was in, in uh, social pedagogic, uh, focusing uh, art therapy, focusing uh, therapy uh, in music and theater. So I worked uh, as a set designer, and here that's a set design I did for uh, Samuel Beckett. He directed uh, the play End Game. So I did work for different theater groups, but uh, for uh, Beckett I uh, was uh, designing set for End Game, for Crab's Last Tape, <coughs> and I don't what, what was I don't even remember. So it it's. Uh, it was just like uh, another way to, to work in, in this artistic field. At the same time, going to the junkyard, going to the flea markets in Berlin, I found a, a tin box which uh, had a label on top. It almost looked like a record uh, label, but inside was just like a spool of wire. And uh, I never you know, like, uh, saw a spool of wire like this with a label. So it turned out it was actually a, a, a spool, a metal spool for a, a tape recorder. And before the plastic tape, the reel-to-reel, -reel was uh, existing, there was a wire recorder. And a wire recorder you could record on a piece of wire, the same like a piece of plastic tape. Instead of uh, the plastic tape, you have a piece of wire. But I couldn't listen to these wires. So uh, I took um, a Japanese reel-to-reel -reel, uh, tape recorder apart uh, with a recording head and with an amplifier. And I put it, there was this toy, a clown on a string. When the string was up there, the clown would bicycling down. And so I, I used this amplifier, strapped it on the back of the clown. And way in the back, the taping, uh, the recording head was going on the wire. So as soon the clown would go down the wire, I could listen what was recorded on this wire. So then I thought, when it's possible to put memory in a piece of wire, like it doesn't, could be my own voice, could be singing, could be anything recording, uh, then it should also be possible to put memory in a piece of paper. So I was starting to make these magnetic scores, use filing very fine metal dust on a piece of paper, mix it with alcohol, put it, uh, scrubbed it on this paper, and then I was drawing these staff lines. But then I used the same uh, recorder device from this cheap Japanese uh, uh, tape recorder at a microphone and the tape head, and I would talk and going along the staff lines, and my voice would be recorded on this uh, paper. So it was meant to be to be in the gallery. That later, uh, when somebody comes in, they would take a tape, this tape head, and with the headphones, and follow the same kind of staff lines, and they could listen what was recorded on this piece of paper. So this was kind of understanding how memory works. That memory could be just. Uh, uh, be on a, on a piece of paper. So I was starting to put it on different kind of uh, paper and, and there was all recordings on this kind of artwork. At the same time, I was uh, starting to build um, 
a reader for mechanical player piano roles, so I could actually transfer this data into uh, a computer database. So I was starting to wire wrap uh, all the computers together, and this was in the early 80s, late 70s, early 80s. And at this time, there was no printed circuit boards uh, uh, first done. You did wire wrapping, like from point to point from each chip uh, connector or uh, socket, uh, you would, you know, like just uh, do uh, this connection from, from all this uh, computer chips. So this was the backside of, of, the, uh, of the board, and on the other side it was all the chips, so everything was hand-wired. And this was my first uh, music computer, and on the right here, this was my disk drive because uh, in the early days you, you didn't have any uh, floppy disks. You actually would get a program which was on a cassette and you use a cassette re recorder to uh, transfer whatever was uh, recorded in memory on the cassette recorder. So first I had one cassette recorder, but then I needed more channels, so up to 16. So this was kind of a 16-track uh, disk drive. And one morning I came back to my studio and it was mounted on the wall and the whole thing collapsed and was down on the floor. Then it was time to buy kind of a five and a half inch floppy drive. <clears throat> but here on the left, and this was pre-MIDI, like this was, MIDI didn't exist at this time, but it was very similar. It had like 16 different uh, channels uh, with LEDs. You could see the notes you would play on, on the keyboard. And, and you could actually uh, capture uh, your playing on the keyboard and put into memory, and it was basically put on these tapes. So the tapes didn't have audio information, it was just like digital information. And so I started uh, to use uh, the human as a, as a source for, uh, for some kind of a rhythm, for some kind of a pulse, or the saxophone had uh, when you was playing the saxophone, it would all uh, read the finger position and the pressure of the of the finger. So it was basically just like using live a live musician to uh, capture all this uh, or tricking other instruments with the keys, which was uh, when the uh, when the musician was playing. All this information was going back in this computer, and every time I was uh, uh, looking for some kind of uh, device. I needed a random number generator, so I used these 24 bobbing chickens. You might uh, remember, I don't know, this was from the 70s, and, uh, and each chicken had a, a light reflector on the head, and as soon as they went down, an optical sensor would trigger, and under their butts there was a light bulb, so there was always warm air kind of uh, rising, so they was constantly bobbing. And uh, so 24 chickens uh, bobbing constantly, so it's like a 24-bit configuration. So you get millions of different combinations at a certain time. So they basically was uh, operating this IBM Selectric typewriter, and they had solenoids on top, and, uh, and they would actually uh, print uh, a letter. In this case, this was uh, redone in nine, like a, 20 years later or 25 years later, and uh, we used, like just like maybe five years ago, we used all the radio addresses Bush gave every Saturday. And this radio address, all the words that were stored in memory, like unique words were stored, and every time the chicken would go down, they would select a word, it was typed, uh, in real time on the uh, typewriter. So they was actually uh, typing sentences based on, on the radio addresses. And sometimes when he was reading these sentences, they made sometimes more sense than the original. <laughs> so it was quite interesting to see that chickens actually could uh, make some sense out, out of these uh, words. Our other project was using uh, record players, but there was pottery wheels underneath each record. Like, uh, this was also like, again, reuse, like I couldn't find, you know, eight uh, record players, so I just used pottery wheels, used uh, 
uh, record arm, and they was all hooked up to uh, a computer so you could turn them all on at the same time, or stop them, or go backwards, forwards, and I used to use like uh, records, for example. Uh, but one project was using the, you probably don't know this guy, but uh, his name is Wayne Newton, kind of a sleaze bag from, from Las Vegas. And uh, he had a song once called Danke Shane. And, uh, and I had eight identical records of Danke Shane, and they would start together and then slowly they would fade apart, and then it wasn't Duncan Shane anymore. Uh, so going back and forth, and, and like, almost like scratching. And, uh, and when you play Duncan Shane backwards, it sounds like Bin Laden for some reason. Anyway, so with this, uh, this was also interactive. Actually, I had chick the chickens were also was once hooked up to the records, so they would actually choose certain records, play together. Sometimes I had ins instructional records, like uh, there was eight different lessons on how to quit smoking without you know, will losing your willpower, or how to learn the language of money. You know, it was all this kind of instructional records, and there was kind of an absurd conversation going on when they were kind of talking together. So each project was kind of uh, this built instruments, uh, all me mechanically kind of operated. And, uh, or sometimes um, uh, a TV, these boxing figures uh, from the British, uh, what was it called, uh, spitting image uh, series like Gorbachev, Reagan, uh, uh, Mr. T was kind of conducting, uh, Rambo was shooting on top of the pianos, like the uh, wrestler guys was jumping on the toy piano. So as soon as you uh, t uh, put in 25 cents, they would, uh, beat each other and box each other uh, in a rhythmic, uh, with a rhythmic uh, drum uh, computer playing right next to it. So it was all rhythmically uh, synchronized. Or uh, this installation was like uh, Dutch wooden shoes, which had a, a mallet mechanism built inside. And right now I don't have time to, to show all the videos, but we might just show this particular video how the Dutch wooden shoes make sound. Uh, at the end, or changing like the timbre of a piano, uh, there was like a box with 88 uh, fingers, like solenoids, would play the keys, and then the other uh, configuration would uh, bow the strings, would uh, pluck the strings, would damp the strings, almost like a robotic device, which would lower slowly to the strings, and then make all the preparation of the strings, like John Cage did in 1940, and I, uh, in the 50s and 60s, like the prepared piano. Now, other investigation was using water as a, a medium to make sound. So on the ceiling, there was like 127 water valves, and below each water valve, there was a glass vessel, and um, so there was a keyboard in the front. So when you was pushing a key, one water drip was released and falling into one of the tuned vessel. So with one key, you would dum, da dum, da dum, da dum. So you could actually visualize how the rhythmic uh, pattern looks like with water, like one drip and then two drips you could see. But then you had like over a hundred drips falling down. So it was like visualizing a sound how a player piano roll moves by with a, with a graphical score. You could use the water drips to do the same, to see how the temporal structure looks visually first with the water drips, and then a second later, you could hear it. So the, all the water drips was very precise. And uh, again, reuse was, uh, I found uh, over 100 fruit juice dispensing valves, which, you know, these Coca-Cola machines, you know, have this kind of, same valve when, when you push the glass in the front and then the liquid goes in there. But of course, I had to make them absolutely quiet and precise so you could uh, have, uh, when you press the key on the keyboard very softly, a tiny drip would fall down. When you push harder with a higher velocity, then a, a bigger drip would fall down. And then later I also, and this was, I don't know, 91. Uh, this went to Switzerland into a museum and uh, 
And then a year later for our other museum, I did the same kind of uh, installation, but then uh, spelling words and spelling letters with water. So I could actually, like when you spell an H, for example, you have 12 valves right next to each other. You turn number one and 12 on, so you get one part of the H coming down, and then you turn on for a few milliseconds all the 12 valves, so you get your bracket of the H, so you, you see actually letters falling down. And uh, so, to, so you could also spell names or any or uh, spelling poetry with water. So uh, it's just like there was a lot of Seattle glass artists donated their uh, glass work. Like uh, there's, there were several Chihulis in there, like this white one over there is a Chihuly and the blue one back there. Unfortunately, they all broke. Uh, they they was traveling so much uh, in the last 20 years, and every time you got it back, there was like one or two glass pieces basically broken. And and uh, so other installation was like a, a, a fleet, like a sounding uh, fleet with with uh, wireless uh, communication, wireless MIDI communication. And this was way before we had our wireless systems uh, now ready uh, in our iPhones or with our routers like this was uh, uh, all the instruments was uh, radio controlled and there was a conductor bike which uh, co was connected to all the signals so the drums would play in, 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 in uh, synchronization. Also working with uh, dancers, with choreographers, I was uh, fortunate to get commissions from different choreographers from, uh, I worked with Merce Cunningham, uh, was commissioned to do a piece, or Elliot Feld uh, from New York, or here locally with Matt, what's, uh, Matt, uh, no, I'm just blanking on his name, uh, Wade Madsen, is his name, yeah. Huh? Wade Madsen. Wade Madsen, that's right. And yeah, it's, it's quite a long time ago, when this happened so uh, but it's also always great to you know collaborate with other uh, people in the arts and of course each piece has uh, you know like a, a notation I always work on this was kind of for the dancers what what kind of movements or this was um, the graphical score for the Merce Cunningham dance company which traveled all over the world uh, with this piece so in this case the instruments was hanging above the audience uh, you couldn't see it, but you could hear the sound came from above you. And then the audience was focusing on the dance movement of the dancer, but the sound came from all over because the instruments was just uh, uh, suspended from the ceiling. And this was always the interest in my work to add other dimension to sound using space, like moving the sound through space. So, so you really could... Uh, uh, use this kind of instrumentation, like here this was at the Henry Arts Gallery where air was used as a medium only to make sound and this installation was called like P-H-F-F-F-T so was kind of how the sound moves through, through the space or private commissions, that was a doorbell when you ring the bell, then a lot of things going on this was an installation with uh, making sound with fire, the fire organ. Like each tube had a Bunsen burner, a computer controlled Bunsen burner built in. And warm, when warm air is rising, uh, you create uh, an air column in this pipe and it sounds like an organ pipe. So with a keyboard in front, you're basically just changing the temperature. There's always a yellow flame, a warm like uh, a pilot light going on. But when you push the key down uh, a sleeve, goes low, uh, lowers down and oxygen mixes with the gas, it gets a hotter uh, flame and then it sounds like an like a organ. Oh, this was an installation for a museum in, let's see, this was in, in St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, this was translating seismic data. Every earth time an earthquake uh, happened somewhere, it would transfer the P wave and the S wave, which look almost identical like, like sound waves, into musical um, notations. So uh, this was about 40 feet high, uh, these different xylophones, kind of xylophones. They have uh, wooden bars and metal bars and resonators, natural amplifiers. So when the earthquake was in, in, in Asia, for example, then 
uh, the section with the pentatonic scale would play. So it sounds like more an Asian instrument when the earthquake was in Africa than the other section which had, uh, was playing more rhythm, African rhythms. So people who are working there immediately can tell where the earthquake is coming from because there's about 20, 30 earthquake every day over a Richter scale above number five. So there's always uh, something playing. And again, uh, scores, there's always like uh, each piece gets scored. And they are, of course, not for musicians. Uh, they are more for me to transfer these ideas into uh, how the sound would go around. Or sometimes just using this post-it, uh, make a composition out of a different uh, ways how, how, how to layer this, this uh, post-it uh, paper or other uh, graphical scores. This was an installation at uh, Lake Union about underwater sound pollution because there was a hydrophone going into the water, not the one I'm sitting, the other one. And then when a boat went by, uh, the piano uh, adapter would play the 88 keys. So when a, a diesel engine goes by, then it's more like a staccato sound, like duck, 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 and plays certain kind of staccato type music. But when a jet ski goes by, fast glissandis was playing. So when you are a fish down there, or when a boat goes above you, you don't want to be a fish down there. It's really noisy. So that was kind of just like it was floating on Lake Union at, at the opening day of the boaters, and they, they didn't realize that they actually made, created the music with their uh, noise of their boats. So other uh, installation was Conlon in Purple, which was also dealing, there was like six different layers Sometimes um, a layer would play on top or uh, it only would play on the bottom. So when you walk through this instrument, then uh, you really uh, could notice what was going on. And I think we are running out of time. Uh, that's also reused. It was about 700 guitars which are up there. They are old uh, used guitars which couldn't be repaired anymore. And about 32 of them playing uh, uh, automatically. So it's just uh, that's at the airport, uh, this uh, installation, when you walk by, it looks for some kind of movements of, of light and then it starts to uh, move and, and uh, moving back and forth. And these are usually the sketches you have to convince the jury uh, to, uh, uh, you have these ideas and they always get confused because they would ask, don't you have a photograph? No, it doesn't exist yet. So, uh, so sometimes, or one installation, this, I just want to uh, explain this a little bit. It has like three rings, and it was in a building designed by Saha Hadid uh, in a museum in Germany. Uh, three rings, they was based on the ratio three to four to five, going back to Pythagoras, uh, using the same idea. But I want to uh, visualize how music, uh, a major chord looks like, like the note C, E, G, is also in the same ratio, three to four to five. So you can actually see how this major chord looks like by not listening to it because it's always uh, noisy in a museum. So for example, when, when uh, the sphere moves, there are three spheres inside, and when sphere is moving, and there would be a light going straight ahead, and the shadow on the wall would actually show the sine wave. And it shows the frequency, how fast it goes, and the amplitude. So you could visualize just by uh, playing a major chord with the spheres. Or you can also, there are different modes, you can also tell what time it is. You can assign the biggest sphere, that the, uh, the biggest ring that the sphere would take 12 hours per revolution. The next one would take 60 minutes per revolution. The lowest one, 60 seconds. So when you look up, you can say, like in this case, let's say 12 o'clock, it's way back there. So it's 6, it's a little bit after 6, 15, and 55 seconds. So you could, could tell what time it is. Or uh, when you think about uh, Earth, like the planet, our planetary system, like Mars, Earth, and Venus, they're almost in the ratio 3 to 4 to 5. So you can see the tempo relation. The Earth would take 365 days per revolution assigned, and then the lowest would be, uh, 
would, would be Venus, which is much more faster. But the top, top one is, is Mars, which is still working with the sphere when Earth is already done. So you can also see the temporal relation in our planetary system. And that's just like a few other, uh, like this is an eight foot uh, CD, uh, slowly rotating but triggering uh, other musical installations or the Jack Box or working with the Kronos Quartet and uh, other uh, public artwork uh, in Ojai, the Sound Arch, or working with the composer Conlon and Caro who punched paper rolls. And I just did a retrospective about his uh, percussion orchestra, which he designed in 19. 50, and this never could be played because he tried to use pneumatic hoses to operate all the mechanical beetles, but air was too slow to do this. So uh, 60 years later, it, it could be recreated by using electrical solenoids uh, to do his work. And also, uh, the last uh, exhibit was, we are just like uh, John Cage and then Caro, they celebrated their 100th birthday. Uh, so this was kind of dedicated um, like here, a scanner uh, reads the uh, information, the color, and this sends then, uh, that's a graphical score, it sends the information back to the pianos, and then the piano starts to play. So we just stop here because uh, we also want to have a little bit uh, time to, to answer some questions. Oh, the video, yeah. Um, just as the clumpen. Uh, See, you have to, it's here, yeah. It's just like a, a very short uh, video to, uh, let's see. So everything is MIDI controlled, uh, so every musician could, you know, like uh, interact or interface uh, to all the installations. And also, uh, since a few years, I'm using now actually the iPhone. I don't have one yet, uh, and I don't need one. And uh, but I have an iPod where I can test, and all of these installations are now possible to activate uh, with a with the iPhone. And I had, uh, I'm an Apple developer and uh, pay every year this $99 fee. And last year I told Apple I'm ready for my application to be sold, uh, not sold for free on the iTunes store. So Apple wrote back and said, sorry, your application is, will not be on the store because it doesn't have any functionality. Then I wrote back and said, look, I can push buttons uh, with this device and, and activate everything. There's a lot of functionality because in a museum, <laughs> gallery, you know, email came back, no, sorry, we won't put this on the store because zero functionality. So I got kind of mad, you know, and, and uh, <laughs> then I looked the first time, what's on the iTunes store? And uh, so I found quite a, a lot of application with a lot of functionality, like how to make sound of a fart. <laughs> so, <laughs> I wrote back and said, what functionality this particular application has, you know? <laughs> then the email came back, of course not addressing this, uh, not answering anything, saying just like, we want to see uh, a movie to prove your application has any functionality. So what I did, um, I have uh, other installation, six of my old laptops, uh, 
they are not working anymore, Apple laptops. I put them on a music stand, and each laptop had two mallet, a uh, mechanical mallet mechanism. So it looked like a, it's called a uh, laptop percussion sextet. Uh, and uh, I said, okay, look, and I pushed the button here, and they were starting to play. And, uh, and then I also had my water dripper still up in my studio and said, there other kind of functionality I can show when I push, say, spell a name, and then water would actually spell apple. <laughs> so the next day I got the email that said, your, your application will be on the, on the store. <laughs> so, so that means, you know, like, uh, they couldn't understand that something is not in this box, like it was outside the box, and that was too much for Apple. And, and uh, because they never under they thought it has to come out of this device and not from somewhere else. And that's probably the confusion. They couldn't realize that you actually could, you know, like uh, trickle something else which it's not built in. So that's always this kind of difficulty sometimes to convince, you know, like people when you come sometimes for a new proposal, whatever, it's always difficult to convince because it doesn't exist at this moment, you know, like it has to be developed first. So, but I'm glad to answer a few questions. No questions? Great. Uh, <laughs> so we can go home. Oh, there's one. No, it, it actually uh, just is scanning light. There was a light uh, sensor, like a, a color sensor, like, uh, which just reads, uh, spits out numbers. And even on a white, uh, there was you know, a lot of white parts on, on, on the sc screens. Every part of uh, on the paper gave slightly a little bit a different number. So when you move the joystick and you push the button, uh, whatever number it was written, it was choosing a composition uh, and then be played on the pianos. So it wasn't my last uh, setup, I actually used the RGB uh, uh, configuration, where when it was seeing a red uh, color, it would actually play the red piano. So still the light sensor, the color sensor, got confused when, when it was a dark day, it was a different red than from or evening light, you know, in the gallery. So it was very difficult to, to calibrate it to, to the right. So this time I thought, well, I just want to read numbers because white, there are so many different whites or so many different reds. So it was just triggering a different composition. I would love to hear more about uh, your work with the Kronos Quartet. Uh -huh. Well, this was kind of, uh, when they asked me to do this commission, I told them I don't just want to write a piece of music, uh, notation, give them, let them rehearse for a couple of days, and then there's a concert, and then that's it, maybe a recording, you know. I wasn't interested in this kind of process. I told them when we work on a collaboration, everybody should be a part of it. And the idea was also um, that they might leave their instruments at home not showing up to the performance with their instruments. But then the, uh, the viola player, Hank, he refused to leave his instrument at home. He thought uh, he is a musician, he wants to bring his instrument uh, for the performance. And because they were supposed to, to play other uh, modified instruments. But then I wrote, rewrote the piece and then Hank could actually use his own instrument to play. So some of the violins, for example, uh, had sensors optical sensors. One piece in the score was saying um, it should be uh, based, like they are 30 years together now, or at this time a few years ago, and um, they should choose six, uh, or six pieces they, pref they like through, through their career. And they should choose this CD, and every time they put this particular CD over this sensor, uh, it would play this uh, particular piece, but when they take it away, it stops playing, stops. So they could then use six different uh, uh, of their favorite CDs 
And they made actually then their own collage with the uh, four, with the whole quartet, because then they played together. So it was kind of uh, improvising with their favorite pieces, but very short sometimes. So it was just playing when it saw the sensor. The CD basically was just a reflector triggering a sound file, what was chosen by them. So there was all this kind of working out with the, each member together. They played on toy violins, and they had to practice quite a lot on toy violins. And they made beautiful sounds, you know. First, mm, toy violins, you know, like, uh, but it was, it was sounding uh, quite different when, when you practice a little bit with a toy violin. So there was, there was uh, uh, through, through, through the whole process of this collaboration, we worked together with, with uh, uh, exploring different ways to do a whole evening uh, a concert. And uh, so for them, it was, they never did something like this before. It was, uh, afterwards, they said it was a great experience because before they just practiced for a few hours, performed, and then it was history. One more question I heard. Okay. Well, first, it's always like the sound, you know, is the, the primary uh, concern. What kind of sound I want to create in this particular space? It depends. It's a public space. It's an architectural space. It's, it's a, a, a private commission. What kind of space? So I have to be in the space first before I do anything. So I have to visit uh, this site or this place, you know, and look what's, what's around. And, and sometimes, you know, clap. How, how does it sound? What, what kind of instrument or what kind of sound could be done in this particular space? And then throughout the years, like I have books full, sketchbooks full of, you know, uh, ideas. And sometimes I go look through what, what was done years and years uh, ago in terms of ideas. So it's the process, you know, it's, it's from sketch. It's always sketching. Also, uh, graphical scores. I'm, I'm working quite a bit on graphical scores, which only I can read. It wouldn't make sense, you know, that this would be given to a musician because they couldn't read it or not playing it. But I use this as kind of a blueprint to, this helps me to get to the next step, what I want to express with this kind of uh, sketch or it's almost like an abstract uh, uh, sketch, but this could be different a year later. So then the process, doing a prototype and uh, it's just like, going step by step, and then on paper, everything works great. But as soon as you, you uh, build this kind of device, you you've realize, wow, that's too noisy physically. It's, it makes the wrong sound, you know, and, and uh, so it's always going back and forth. So that's, it's changing once in a while, but it's always like this kind of step by step. Well, I guess, thanks for coming. And... Uh, <laughs>